So my name is Dr. Michael Lowe. I work at Monash Medical Centre where I work as a, a consultant haematologist in both the laboratory and the clinical setting and I'm also the co-myeloma lead for Monash Health. I'm interested in all blood cancers um, but my particular interest is in myeloma and the related plasma cell neoplasms. Myeloma in its simplistic form is a uh, cancer of plasma cells which are also known as antibody secreting cells. Okay. Um, and antibodies are very important because they help protect our body against infections. But sometimes that, um, those antibody secreting cells can go awry and they can form uh, multiple myeloma, uh, which is an incurable blood cancer, uh, which uh, can lead to numerous complications, including bone marrow suppression, um, bone disease, um, and immunosuppression, um, and can be very serious. A lot of people with multiple myeloma will actually be completely asymptomatic when they're first picked up. Um, and it can be picked up on a, on a blood test called a serum protein electrophoresis, uh, whereby they can pick up the abnormal antibodies that the myeloma is um, producing. It's called a M-protein or a paraprotein. Um, if those antibodies do deposit in tissues, it can also cause damage to organs. Um, and the classic organs that affects are the kidneys. Um, and so kidney failure or renal failure is one of the classic presentations. And obviously we try and detect that disease before they get to that stage. Can actually deposit in any other organ and the other one of great concern is the heart. Uh, and in that case, it's called amyloidosis. Um, and that obviously is of, of serious, uh, serious nature. Myeloma can also start to eat away at bones. Um, and uh, in that setting, it can predispose people to having fractures. Um, and uh, that obviously can be very painful and very debilitating. Um, and, um, and we obviously try and stop patients from developing bone disease with their myeloma. Uh, and we, as the myeloma attacks the bones, it can also lead to a release of calcium, which is seen in bones. Uh, and that um, can lead to something called hypercalcemia or high calcium levels. Uh, and that can be very serious. That leads to dehydration, confusion, sometimes even psychosis, um, and a lot of bo bony pain. So, um, you know, patients with myeloma can really present in a very diverse way from asymptomatic to, to very ill. Um, and um, it, it does make the diagnosis very difficult um, because there's not one symptom that people will all present and we can say, look, if you get this, come and see us if you have myeloma. Um, but um, with a high index of suspicion um, and a relatively even simple blood test that can be done to, to, to exclude it, um, then I think, um, I think the awareness of myeloma is going up. To treat myeloma, um, essentially, um, we're using uh, a chemotherapy-based approach, okay? Uh, and this is a, a combined chemotherapy. So one of the things that we talked about today in, in, the, in the seminar was that um, uh, combinational therapies are better than single agents. So we don't just give people a single agent because we know they do better if they have a combination of treatments. Uh, the combination is generally a backbone of a, a steroid called a glucocorticoid. Um, the examples of that are dexamethasone and prednisolone um, with some chemotherapy. Um, and we're generally using alkylating agents. So the classic ones are used in myeloma are cyclophosphamide and melphalan. And then there are the novel biological agents of which there are two broad classes. The, the thalidomide analogs, which are sometimes called the image as well. Uh, and the drugs in that class are thalidomide, lenalidomide and pomalidomide. And the second class of biological agents are the proteasome inhibitors. And the two drugs of interest there are bortezomib and carfilzomib. Now, um, in an ideal world, we would love to be able to give um, patients a combination of all four classes of drugs, um, but um, unfortunately, due to cost restraints, um, we aren't able to deliver that in Australia. And unfortunately, most patients will only be exposed to one biological agent at a time. So either a thalidomide analog or a proteasome inhibitor um, one at a time. Um, but in an ideal world, we would be able to give all, all the four classes together. It's very hard to narrow it down to a single breakthrough. Certainly these new class of drugs, which we just talked about, the uh, thalidomide analogs and the proteasome inhibitors really have revolutionized the outcome for patients with multiple myeloma uh, and have really improved a patient's life expectancy uh, astronomically um, since their development. 
Um, so I think the development of those two classes of drugs, uh, as well as some newer therapies, which is now starting to come out, um, some of the monoclonal antibodies, which are really coming out either in trial or just coming onto the market, uh, have really improved outcomes. But um, apart from just the actual therapeutics to target the myeloma, I think the supportive care and the way that we treat patients with myeloma has really improved. Um, so um, bone disease, which we talked about, is a big issue with myeloma patients and the supportive care um, with bone strengthening agents is, is very important, uh, as well as um, protecting them against infections. So um, either pro preventative antibiotics and antivirals, or in some cases, if their antibody levels get very low with treatment, we can give them something called intravenous immunoglobulin, which helps to boost their own immune system by giving other people's antibodies to protect them from infection. And I think these breakthroughs, not just the therapeutics, but the supportive care, are what really seen the improvement in survival of patients with myeloma. The big breakthroughs in myeloma are happening every day, okay? Um, even within uh, Australia or even within Melbourne, there are constant new breakthroughs in terms of our understanding and how myeloma develops, how it works, how it escapes treatment, how it um, causes problems for patients. Um, there are a number of outstanding research institutions doing it here. Um, but um, there is some really exciting breakthroughs coming through from a therapeutic perspective in the next year or two. Um, uh, two of the big ones are targeting a, a protein on the myeloma called BCMA, um, and that's uh, really hotting up. Uh, and it kind of, and the second one is kind of linked into that, but it's something called a, a chimeric antigen receptor or CAR T cells, which are really in trials overseas, and we're hoping that these trials will hit Australia in the next year. Uh, and these are really revolutionising myeloma treatments. Um, obviously, they're very new. We don't know uh, how, how efficacious they will be and how long the response will be. But um, the preliminary data looks very, very promising. And um, essentially, if you're a patient with myeloma, you should be very excited with the new treatments, which are coming out you know, every day that we speak um, because it, it really is changing. It's a rapidly changing field. Uh, and it's one of the most exciting fields to be involved in. As we discussed earlier, bone disease is a, is a major problem for patients with myeloma. The actual myeloma attacks the bones and can actually lead to holes in the bone leading to increased risk of fractures. Um, we know that patients that don't get bone strengthening medication are at increased risk of fractures, uh, increased uh, poor quality of life because of those fractures and increased pain. And so we um, do recommend that people have some form of bone strengthening medication. And the bisphosphonates, such as zoledronic acid or Zometa, is one of the classic bone strengthening medications we use. Um, Zometa is given as a 15 minute infusion um, uh, once a month for patients with multiple myeloma. Um, and it's got good efficacy in patients to strengthen their bones. And I think that any patient with active myeloma should have bone strengthening medication. It does come with side effects, and that certainly is something that we need to explore. Um, but there are some other treatments. They're not what we call bisphosphonate. So there is a new class of drugs. Um, and the one that's on the market at the moment is denosumab. Um, and that's a, a, a subcut injection. So it's an injection in the tummy rather than an infusion. Um, and uh, the evidence for that over Zometa is they look very similar, okay? Um, and uh, from where I sit at this point in time, uh, I would recommend that patients should choose either denosumab or Zometa or some form of drone strengthening medication. And it's really a patient decision about which one's better. I don't think there's good, clear, hard evidence from a scientific perspective as to which one would be uh, a preferred um, regimen. Um, so one of them's an infusion and one of them's a, a subcut injection, uh, and they essentially have very similar side effects. So um, I think that whether you choose one or the other, it doesn't really matter, but you should seriously consider being on one of them, one or the other um, for bone strengthening. Otherwise, you can get yourself in real trouble. The most common questions, obviously, is some of the stuff we just talked about, but uh, uh, what is my prognosis um, and uh, what are the chances of getting, of, of getting a cure? Um, and I think prognosis is a very difficult thing to answer um, because every patient will have a slightly different journey through this disease. But certainly the way I talk to my patients is that what we'd like to see myeloma become is a, is a chronic disease. Um, and there's a lot of focus on cure. Um, but there are a lot of diseases which aren't curable. So high blood pressure or type two diabetes uh, are both not curable conditions, um, but they are both treatable 
Uh, and that's how we'd like to see myeloma, as a disease that you live with and you die with rather than die from, okay? Um, and so uh, when we talk to our patients, we wanna give them hope for the future, uh, but we obviously don't wanna sell them false hope, but we also want them to see this as a journey with us to guide them through. Now, um, in terms of an actual cure, a uh, cure to me implies that I can guarantee you that it's never gonna come back. Um, and that's a difficult thing to promise someone. Um, and I, I do honestly believe that a cure for myeloma is not impossible, and I think it, it potentially could come in the next couple of decades. Um, but there's a lot of work being done looking at this. Um, but at this stage, we cannot tell people that it is a curable condition. Um, and so um, uh, we, we do have to be as honest with them and just say, look, at this stage, what we're hoping to create is that the myeloma becomes a chronic disease, which you check in with us on a regular basis to keep, make sure it's kept under check. And we'd like you to live your life as, as normally as you had before you were diagnosed with myeloma. And that's always been our goal in terms of treating patients. If we can't cure you, is to maximise your quality of life and obviously your longevity as possible. The short answer is very, very important, and I'll try and answer that in, in two different ways. Um, as we just discussed, the, the treatment for patients, uh, there are a number of different treatments you can have for multiple myeloma. Um, and uh, what we're moving towards now is a more a, a individualized approach in that um, uh, not every treatment, one treatment doesn't fit every single patient, and that um, uh, every patient might have a slightly different journey, okay? Um, and that's about us trying to individualize the treatment to maximize the outcome for patients, so give them the best quality of life and quantity of life, um, but minimize the side effects they're exposed to. Uh, and so it's very important for patients to understand their disease and, um, and to understand what they're having done to them, because um, whilst as doctors we have a lot of scientific knowledge, the only person that really understands what's happening to a patient is the patient themselves and their, their loved ones. Um, and so it's very easy for us to look at numbers or look at a patient in a, in a, in a 20 minute consult, but what happens at home will dictate how a patient will tolerate a treatment. So I think it's very important from uh, individualizing their therapy to understand what they're doing. The second thing is that as a doctor, uh, one of the things that we're, we're usually quite good at is treating people physically. But what we, we sometimes don't treat very well is the emotional and the mental um, health side of things of being diagnosed with a blood cancer and in myeloma case, an incurable blood cancer. Um, and so having support from loved ones, from support groups like Leukemia Foundation or, um, is absolutely critical for a patient's well-being um, to know that they're not alone in this journey. Um, you know, uh, it's very easy for a doctor who's only seeing you for 20 minutes um, to look at the physical side of things, but um, supporting you from a, a mental health and emotional health perspective is, is one of the most critical things. And one of the things that I spend a lot of time with my patients talking about is how can we support you from that perspective? Because I can change your regimens, I can change your drugs, I can look at your numbers, I can do all that. But when I'm not there, when you go home that night or you know, on a, late on a Friday night when you're not feeling quite so well, you need that support from an organisation or from your loved ones or your family and friends, okay? And I think that's um, one of the most critical things in, care, in the care of any patient, not just a myeloma patient, but um, when you do have myeloma, a really important thing. 